next um, that is uh, Catherine Jo White's brilliant book. Um, your host for tonight is the very brilliant, uh, weird and wonderful, uh, Gemma Kearney. Uh, and then basically the way the night's going to happen is we're going to have this conversation to set the scene. There's going to be lots of opportunity for you guys to ask some questions. Um, we want to make it as much of a cocoon, so we will let it be comments as well as questions. And then there's going to be time for another drink at the bar. Um, do you feel free to come on in. There's lots of seats in the first and second row. Yeah. Um, and then there will be time for drinks. And then after that, we're going to have more performances and poetry, um, which you can also take part in. So if you're too shy uh, before tonight to sign up, but you have a poem or a performance in you that is itching to get out, then come and find JJ during the break, and um, we will try and fit you in. Um, so without further ado, will you please put your hands together to welcome Gemma Kearney and Catherine Joy White. Yeah, that feels a good place. And we've got each other's drinks. Oh, oh yeah. Of course, you are the fabulous one drinking Prosecco. <laughs> I would say you're the fabulous one with your 0% beer. 0%. So. Zero Far too much wine last night, a.k.a. <laughs> um, this is so fun. Um, firstly, like for health and safety reasons, because I've been conditioned by the BBC, I have to do things officially. Um, if you are worried about the smoke, I'm burning frankincense. Because <laughs> we're in a church building and many other reasons which hopefully will unfold. Um, it gives me great delight to be on stage with somebody that I think I feel so connected to and I, and I need to work out why, which we might learn together, but definitely a soul sister um, and an amazing published author who has written a book that I'm frankly in awe of um, as I'm completing a book. And it has like sisterly, it's kind of in the family of your book. Um, but when yours came out, I was like, oh, this is like, you did it. <laughs> and it's really great. Um, and uh, I think that there's, never too many words or thought or conversation about the brilliance and the honoring of some of those that have like lived before us that we stand on the shoulders of. So please tell us about this thread of gold, Catherine Joy White, everybody. <laughs> I love it. It is a Friday night, so I feel like it's a celebratory book. We're celebrating each other, so it's about, yeah. But yeah, hello everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming me to your beautiful city. I only just got off my train and I'm already like, I feel like I've just released my shoulders and taken about 15 deep breaths. I said I felt like I've breathed for the first time this year. So <laughs> it's beautiful to be here. Um, and yeah, this, this Thread of Gold is my debut book. Uh, and I wrote it in celebration of black women and it's really a book which brings to light a lot of women that probably most of us haven't heard of, puts them alongside some of the more well-known figures um, and along the way of writing it and kind of bringing these stories and tracing these narratives and seeing how they connected, I kind of, well I asked the question why am I the person writing this, why me, you know, someone said what makes it any different to a series of Wikipedia entries, which, uh, thank you Who very said much. that? They were saying it in a complimentary way, but I'm they now come say that to, to me. <laughs> <laughs> but as in the thing that does make it different, which is what they said, but it doesn't suit my narrative right now to say that, was that um, it's finding how I connected to that story and those stories. And I think it's then about passing that on to anyone who picks up the book, which is seeing how we all are part of this tapestry of joy and resilience and you know so much of what's gone before is in us right now and we hopefully are going to pass it on to the next generation and those who come afterwards so I mean that's a yeah. very fumbled introduction no it but. isn't it's really clear to me um and it very much resonates as well I think this um this feeling of generosity by um 
I think I feel like honoring is like the word that I want to use. It's a big word to hold, but it's a really important one. Um, I, like, so my book is called The Immortal Sisterhood, and it comes out next summer. And um, it 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 it's been a really emotional journey. I've been writing it for ages. <laughs> like it was announced in 2020, Feb in February 2020. And it's been such um, a sort of process, almost like grief. You know, they say that there's like seven stages um, where I've had to sit with some of my heroes almost. Um, there are 12 women in particular. Um, and I, 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 when you learn about the tragedy of some of these people, when you are doing the research, it's um, sometimes really difficult. Um, and then you like, I, I sort of have to find, I've had to find a way to move through that um, and to know that it's important to essentially all of us, regardless of our kind of, our, what we're made up of in terms of genealogy, I feel like to honor our ancestors is just so powerful. And I think it is that, that's the perfect phrase to move through that, because I think there were so many moments in the writing, I mean, off the top of my head, writing about um, Miss Major Griffin Gracie, who was one of the first, she was like a major, major kind of pivotal woman in the trans movement. And she, she just spoke really briefly about how um, when she was working as a sex worker, her and her, her sisters would basically make sure that they logged the name or number or whatever of every single client that they were going to go with, just so that if anything happened and if someone didn't come home, that face had been noted. And I think that point of writing was around the time of Sarah Everard, and it's around the time of, you know, you just think about any time I'm getting in an Uber, I'm, sen I'm literally sending my ride to my two sisters. I don't let my sister, you know, and it was that recognition of, this is such a seemingly superficial thing, but we are still connected to that now. And, you know, then other moments of just more, more, yeah, closer to home, but that on, I remember like the day before publication, I took um, a copy of the book to my nan who lives in Newport, South Wales, and mm. she's elderly now and, you know, doing her own thing and just giving her that copy. And then she told me that she'd always wanted to write a book and, obviously had never you know she was an NHS nurse she's she's beautiful amazing woman but just knowing that like that was something she wanted to do and didn't do but she said that yeah you know done that for her so finding how moving through what's gone before is a way of honoring but more than that we are creating opportunities for who knows what like a little five-year-old is going to do that I couldn't dream of now yeah. because of this and I've done it because of my nan who's done it because of Audrey Lord you know it's yeah. we're all connected like that and I, I really love that way of looking at it. I will remember that <laughs> the next time I'm wrapped in imposter syndrome <laughs> Oh, today it's that. Okay. I actually felt a lot better. I saw it in conversation with, I can't remember her name, but she's absolutely incredible. She, she's the author of a book called Black Liturgies. Do you know who I'm talking yes, about? I follow that on Instagram. Yes, she's so amazing. She's like, oh my God, unbelievable, amazing. And um, she, it was very moving to hear her in a conversation describe her writing process because she was saying, you know, she can feel physical pain and I related to it I was like oh I mean and um it just it was kind of just, it was very moving like her talking about like moving through and using like the words to she was describing like writing like in bed and like all the you know this kind of very physical um expression um like I, I mean for me like I've definitely upped my my yoga practice <laughs> Yeah, like, got a fine peace of mind. <laughs> um, and today I was in a gong bath, so you've got particularly hippie me today. Um, <laughs> I'm not wrapped in imposter syndrome, I'm floating. <laughs> um, and also very, very happy to be here in company. Um, tonight's like a sort of a more unusual uh, book event, obviously, because it's Lighthouse. <laughs> and um, we're going to have an open mic, and I know that some of you have prepared something to speak about, but if any of you are feeling 
uh, like you want to be part of tonight, then please do with whatever, even if you just like, want to stand up and speak. I went to an incredible um, get together recently on the theme of freedom and peace. And I thought it was really interesting that they used the language of freedom and peace um, because a lot of protest was happening all around the country. Um, and this was one of the things that I could get to physically. And um, it just became much more, for me, conducive of community building um, rather than just sharing rage and pain. It was like, again, it, it's this thing. It's, it was moving through. And uh, this, a really incredible person got up and just basically spoke about their Buddhist practice for a while, and it was, it was perfectly held. So if anybody wants to get up and say anything today and is inspired, then you are genuinely welcome. Like, we are in this time, like, together. <laughs> um, who in the book did you have a real laugh with? Like, who have you been like, you're just so my friend? Because <laughs> I've got women in my book that are my mates. <laughs> I've never asked that before. I love that. The first person that's just come to my mind is uh, a woman called Stagecoach Mary, mm -hmm. who uh, I guess probably was forced into a life that didn't suit her, and she kind of was working as a groundskeeper in a convent um, and had a lot of kind of head to heads with the nuns, but ended up befriending the mother superior. Um, as you do. As you do, <laughs> of course. And she was about, I think she was six foot two tall and she weighed like almost 200 pounds. I think she was, you know, she, she was a force to be reckoned with. And she got into a standoff with one of the monks and ended up pointing a gun at him. So she got kicked <laughs> out of the convent. But um, she went, stayed in touch with the Mother Superior and Mother Superior was on a mission a few years later and Stagecoach Mary went and nursed her back to health. Oh, wow. You know, beautiful. But then she ended up becoming the first African-American woman to basically carry mail across the US. So she was the first, that's hence the name Stagecoach. And come rain or shine, she would deliver the mail in Montana where, where she lived. Stop. Yes, and it gets better, it gets better. There are legends that she would, you know, like when it was when it was too snowy, she would just like do it herself, like drag it across. She fought like wolves with her hands. But also, she became such a loved figure in the town mm. that well, women weren't allowed in bars, but she was allowed. And uh, they kind of had a national holiday in honor of her birthday. And her house burnt down, and the citizens of the town saved up enough money to rebuild it for her. So she just became this like absolute figure but she you know she took no nonsense and mm -hmm. she didn't really care what people thought of her and she kind of did her own thing but I just imagine I could just imagine being in a saloon with her and like yeah I probably still have my Prosecco <laughs> <laughs> but with cheers and I love that what do you reckon she would be drinking I feel like a scotch or yeah, something okay. really like sexy and moody <laughs> <laughs> oh man now like there's new concepts forming in my mind of just like having like the drink with it's like the dream dinner party isn't yes. it I definitely, I've been writing about Betty Davis, yeah. um, the funk singer, Betty Davis. And, um, oh my goodness, just what, I mean, it's actually maybe like an aesthetic thing for me as well, because I try to express myself through clothes, um, and I, I love clothes. I actually said to my partner earlier as I got ready, I was like, you know how we both agreed that like music is a performance enhancing drug? And he was like, yeah, because he's like quite like into fitness and he listens to a lot. He's like quite that kind of, you know. And uh, but we agreed on the music thing because he loves music. I mean, we're both Pisces. We're both. He's like a really creative, gentle soul, really. But he just listens to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and actually grew up in Montana, which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like yeah. So uh, I believe that cloves are also <laughs> a performance enhancing drug. <laughs> um, and he's just like, yeah, okay, because there's, defi there's definitely a lot of outfits that happen, you know, in this household. Um, but with Betty Davis, I have just so, like, and I'm being, like, conceptual, like, but, so I haven't actually gone mad, but I feel like I've been getting dressed with her because just, like, her clothes are so epic. <laughs> like, that 70s um, expression in New York at that time, my days, like, the agency... Like the sexuality, like the, the genre of funk, like in style, 
oh, it sits very well with me. <laughs> um, I feel like we need a moment of silence for the green suit. Ooh. Yeah, right? Yes, yes. Um, did anybody, was anybody at a recent talk that I did with Imogen Heap? Okay, it was very interesting. Uh, it, got re it got really raucous, it was really fun. Like she was like really like in a sort of particular space um, where she was just like, yeah, I want to go on a date. He wants to go on a date with me tonight. Oh. <laughs> and then it just like, it sort of, like you just reminded me of that because people were like, I'll take you up for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Oh my right? gosh. <laughs> I will put you in touch happily. <laughs> I love matchmaking. <laughs> Incredible. Wow, what a night. Um, actually, when Cilla Black, um, no, Cilla Black hadn't been doing it for a while, but um, when they announced they were going to do Blind Date again on ITV, uh, I remember I was like, I'm actually going to be shameless enough to tweet that I should be the person. <laughs> <laughs> and people were like, I kind of love that for you. And I was like, yes. <laughs> I didn't get it. Oh. But I did, I did miss out to Paul O'Grady, which is fine, you know? Like, that's actually fine. <laughs> There's much more annoying decisions that it could have been. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit more about your work, because you're very multifaceted, um, which is fantastic, and again, resonates. I do lots of different things. I try to articulate it all of the time. Um, and I just sort of, I think at the moment I say, you know, like, depending on which role I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and actually somebody really helped me somebody who I find very progressive and I respect their opinion said well, you know of course you're code switching all of the time you are a woman um, and you're black you know like and you have lots of different roles in the world so code switching is something to think about and I was like Phew. I was like, yeah. And also another reason why I feel like I am a good citizen of the world in the sense that I love to travel. <laughs> because I love to be in different environments and I love to be open to learning and um, like letting like beauty or nature or the brilliance of humans actually like sink into my skin rather than like just doing that, you know. Um, uh, so, what have you been up to, aside from your absolutely epic book? Yes, I think it's also, before we get into that, I do think that's so interesting, the thing about code switching, because I have got to a point where when someone says, so what do you do? And then I just go like, which is it's also a really boring question anyway. I like to say to people, what have you done today? Because I think that gives more of a flavour of them as a person. But I've started to find it a really stressful conversation, and I'm trying to unpick why. Is it because... I don't feel like I'm qualified enough to do all of those things, which is, you know, I am because I'm doing them. I don't know. So I'm thinking about this a lot. Um, but yeah, I work, my day job, I work as a gender expert for the UN. Um, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> as you do. Seriously, um, like, you need to dust the shoulders when you say that. <laughs> but yeah, I also run a, a film production company, which is, you know, dedicated to elevating voices of... I guess those we don't hear enough of, especially black women and girls, um, and also an actor and a writer, and so just navigating all these. Can I just spot these, you? Please spot me. We both got rings on, so <laughs> yeah. let's, let's pray for our fingers. <laughs> I love this. Um, but yeah, and I think even that was something in the process of writing when I got to the like kind of section on Audrey Lord and you know learning about self care actually coming from Audrey Lord as she was mm. battling cancer and like the complexities of being a black queer woman you know trying to exist let alone trying to dismantle certain structures of oppression she was writing about self-care and that concept and we feel it seems now that it's so kind of co-opted into something very different mm. not that it's a bad thing to to be kind to yourself and I don't know go on holiday or whatever but yeah it's also like it is more than that and I think just leaning into that led me to kind of really look at all the things I was doing and think okay I, I do love everything I'm doing, but what am I trying to prove and who am I trying to prove it to? And do I really need to be like having five full-time jobs? Like, do I really, you know, and then I was looking at all the things that, I guess the darker side of that. And mm. I'm thinking, you know, I can't write this book and say like, we need to be kind to ourselves and not practice that. So 
it's actually led me to be a bit more radically honest, I would say. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe we're going to go down to like four full-time jobs or maybe three and a half, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think you're younger than me, I don't know, but I think you are, that's a guess. It doesn't matter about what ages we are, but, but I will say the, that moment of leaning into change um, and its gift is the best thing. <laughs> it feels so fucking good <laughs> because you can say no thank you not today <laughs> you can say that was amazing like thank you goodbye <laughs> um and it is freeing um it's so hard why is it so hard it's hard because we're conditioned as capitalists <laughs> And that is a daily practice in itself. <laughs> but there are ways. <laughs> and it's, um, it's such an interesting journey, I've got to say, to like decolonialize one's mind is um, something that I just don't find boring. <laughs> you know? I find it very, very hard, but I'm like, it makes me feel alive. Because like... Who knows what's the other end of it? Right? right? Like, who knows what's there? As yeah. Such one yeah. It's a good time to be us. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of options, yeah. you know, and that can be overwhelming. Or liberating. But I choose, I choose liberation. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't know who you read yourself. Like who? Who? I mean, obviously Audrey Lord. Like yeah. I hope that that we are all enjoying and honouring Audrey Lord by reading her work often. And if not, then, oh my goodness, you're going to have a good time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, who, who else, like, in terms of modern thinkers, who do you rate? I mean, the most recent book I read was Afua Hirsch's new book. Oh. And I found that really fascinating, actually. And it engage, it's, you know, it's engaging with similar themes, but I think this idea of, like, yeah, grappling with ourselves mm. and what we... Yeah, how, how we exist and how we move as people, as like a complex nexus of identity characteristics. What, what are we if we start to break those down and strip them away? And I think it, that to me is really interesting at the minute. You know, mm. what if I remove something? How do I then exist yeah. in the world? And again, it's coming back to like the code switching thing and thinking about who and what we are. But I think that has a lot of possibility as well. Yeah. Um. I, I, I also very much rate Afia Hirsch and her new book is on my shelf. I can't wait to read it, but I've had, I've been lucky enough to have personal conversations with her as well. And when she was writing, um, we spent some really nice time together, like a short amount of time, but it was, it meant a lot to me. And um, I just kept on being, it, just to be in her company and to hear her speak, like it felt real. Like I've met a lot of known people and like I don't, authenticity is a bit of a co-opted word, but when people really are real, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like she she is embodying what she's writing about. Yeah. Um, I actually went to, you know, she's a professor. Yeah. yeah. So um, I went to her, the uni where she teaches. She teaches media and. Um, I was just like, I was on holiday, I don't know. and then she's like, you've got to come meet my students. I was like, okay. I'm still like literally wet from the pool, but I'm ready. And then I was like, I never went, and I never went to university. So, and then suddenly I was at like an LA university. I was at like, UCLA and I was like, oh my God. And I said to like, I like messaged my American boyfriend being like, I've gone back to uni. <laughs> I'm at college. And um, it was amazing. It was like so stereotypically like pleasing. Like he was skateboarding and it was really hard to get around, but exciting. Um, I mean, Clueless is my On favorite Wednesdays film. Wednesdays we were pink. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but I was just like saying to her students, I was like, you don't know how lucky you are. Yeah, like you have literally a scholar, like, like it's attention teaching you. That's like, it's amazing. Um, anybody else? I really like Adrienne Marie Brown. So I'm reading her novella, actually. She's got, I think, two or three. Grievers. It's cool. It's kind of like sci-fi because Octavia E. Butler is her, like, biggest, like, inspiration. And, yeah, it's kind of weird, <laughs> but, like, good. I like it. Yeah, like, black sci-fi. Yes. Bring it on. Afrofuturism, definitely. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. think that there's a place for that in the UK? Afrofuturism? Yes. 
I do. Remember to speak to me. Yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> We're like now like, oh, I'll have another Prosecco. Like, <laughs> I actually am going to have one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But no, and also, I was speaking about this um, in the context of film yeah. stuff the other day, but you know, like, what does it mean to be a writer or a creative? Probably all of us here are going to relate to that in some way. And how can we not feel like we're boxed in by our identity, you know, whether it's like, I am a queer writer or I am a black writer or, you know, what does that mean? And how can we move those stories away? And it feels as though the landscape is shifting, mm -hmm. but it's so easy still to be pigeonholed. And I was doing a talk with um, two authors early this week and uh, the, Colin, he was older, he's, I think he was in his 60s or something, mm -hmm. and he said that he'd always just been, because he writes for, he does a lot of reviews for the, the Times Literary Supplement, but he's also an author in his own right, and he'd always just been, you know, a, a literary critic, author, and then he noticed one day that he'd become a black literary critic, black author. You know, no one had consulted him, that was just what, how his, his bio had changed. And he was really affronted by it, which mm. I do also understand because that's okay if you choose and want to be mm. identified in that way. But if you don't, who, who is it, like, who's deciding that yeah. for you? Yeah. And I think, you know, we want, I, I hope we can tell different stories. Like my TV series I'm writing is, it's a horror and I want to be able to lean into that space, but I don't want it to be like black queer horror. It's like, no, this is a horror. Yeah written by me, featuring all of these different people, but like, it is, this is what it is. Like, accept it and find your own person within that. You're writing a horror. I'm writing a horror. Whoa, um, why horror? Because, yeah, I, I actually hate horror. I, I never watched I, any horror. I, I hate, hate horror as horror. well. I, I was just it. like, oh, wow. Okay, but hear me out, hear me out. I absolutely <laughs> hate horror. <laughs> but then I'm, I'm excited, like, I'm no, excited. It's, it's true, yeah. okay. Then I was in a horror film and I realized the potential of like women-led horror where the horror is not like I'm going to chop your head off and eat your guts, but it's rather like <laughs> oh, that insidious horror that you live with, you know, probably we can all recognize it for various reasons. You live with a horror of, I don't know, fear of walking home alone at night or yeah. whatever it is. And the idea of like writing a narrative where you can triumph over that, but it's not like steeped in reality it's not just yeah. it's not just an everyday story so you can lean into like the world that makes it come alive i don't know i think it's filled with possibilities and it's That's a really very exciting cool. story one of my best friends is a director and a creative and a performance artist that like again she does lots of modalities yeah. but she it, she's very, like she also wants to make horror and writes horror and loves being in it and i'm just like oh, i don't know how much i can watch but i really support you <laughs> <laughs> and you're really cool. <laughs> but I, yeah, amazing. What an amazing thing to try and, d well, to do. You're doing it. You're not even trying. But I think also the more of us, like, leaning into this genre, leaning into these genres will make it feel more accessible. Yeah. Probably the reason a lot of us hate horror is because, I don't know, it has been, like, women being yeah. mutilated. or I don't know. Why yeah. would you want to watch that? I just don't get it. <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, we don't, yeah. Some people like it, it's, you know, each their own. It's, uh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, please do take some of my stuff with a pinch of salt and feel free to um, debate in the question time. <laughs> <laughs> I, li I like chat. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, there's so much to talk about. There's so much to talk about. What else could you, like, do, like, what else do you want to do? What's on the dream list? Because... It does seem, on the surface, if, that you're living the dream, like, in terms of... Why do you say that, and what does that mean? Yeah, that's interesting. Let's interrogate that. Oh, wow. I'm going to question you. Do you know that in the BBC archives, there's an amazing show of Maya Angelou um, with her therapist, like, with a therapist? Definitely worth checking out. Um, <laughs> but this is what it feels like, in a good, in a good way, in a good way. Um, I mean, that's not me comparing myself to Maya Angelou. <laughs> I'm just like that, Maya. <laughs> um, okay, so you uh, have a book. You're writing a horror. Um, you look amazing. Like your pink suits are bri is brilliant. Like you know what I mean. Like so again, ov obviously in our modern world, doing all of that is living the dream. Which is why I do ask you it as an interviewer, as an open question. You know. 
Yes. I don't know. I, I'm res I am resistant to, the, to this, mm. of course, because... Uh, resist. Yeah. resist. Let's resist. <laughs> because I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm searching for something more. Maybe I'm on a journey of searching for yeah. something more right now. And I think it's... Yes. I think ach achievements... Uh, Artistically... Is it is it art, an artist? Is it the journey of an artist? I think it's more personal. Do you think? I think so. Well, I think artists. I think artists do make work personally. Yes. Yeah. That is true. Because like I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry to like reference myself in this, but it's make, it's leading me on to my own journey, mm -hmm. which I'm getting weirder. Like, and I want mm -hmm. to be more artistic. <laughs> the more I write, the more, the more artsy I become. Right. And like the more I'm a resistor. Yes. Like the more art I want to make because I think it's really powerful. Yes. Well, I think I think that's it. I think I don't want to, I don't want to fit into someone's narrative of like what a, a dream looks like or what a successful. I don't know because I think what does that mean and mm. to who and that's that's defined by somebody that isn't me and probably isn't a lot of us. And I think for me, it's more about like being part of a bigger community and picture and humanity. Like the reason that all of these things exist is if you look at them at their root, it's a, a, a care and a compassion for people and mm. stories and community. And that to me feels like it should be more of a marker of what we are all striving for mm -hmm. than like... I don't know, like a nomination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, totally. I don't know, and it's trying to navigate all of that and bring that together, I think. That's, that's the dream. And, and it seems strangely radical. Um, you know, I, get, like, I remember watching Michaela Loach on this stage, actually, when their book had just, just come out, and then I was in conversation with Michaela at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Yeah to a sold out crowd yeah. um, in which she staged a walkout, which went viral, yeah. and it was a really interesting moment. Yeah. Um, and, and like, without talking about the weeds of funding, because that's not what we're here to talk about. Mm -hmm. I think that's like, up for everybody to go on their own kind of personal reflection or education if, you know, as to why stuff like that might happen, but take, literally like, wipe away the gossip of that mm -hmm. and like, think about thinking about like what is and isn't radical. Mm -hmm. It was is just like such an incredible concept. Um, and I'm really pleased that Michaela has brought that into the world. Like it's not that radical. Yeah. And why is it so radical to be radical in a world full of shit? Yeah. <laughs> we should all be striving for that. Like yeah. none of us yeah, none of us should be seeing that as radical. Like seri like it's yeah. just like it's such an interesting thing. And yeah. it's like I think if you're British which I don't know if you identify as, I definitely don't always. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, like maybe the Afua British. Yeah. yeah, let's go with that. I'm, I'm down with that today. Um, but if we grew up here, um, I mean, I grew up in England as well, which is another whole thing, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. to be polite. Um, it, is, it is genuinely a deep process to put things into the world, um, to grow openly. Like, my public voice, like, began when I was 23. I got a job on One Extra where I was the co-host of The Breakfast Show. Bang, in it. Like, meeting pop stars, like, going to the Brit Awards. I was a kid. <laughs> like, quite like a vulnerable one, actually, but I didn't think it. I was just like, this is the best. This is the I was living my dream. <laughs> um, but I think... It is hard to be vulnerable and to write and to put things in the world in, you know, even in the industry side of things, still being archaic in many, many, many ways. And I think it is an interesting moment when we like to have that like, moment of like, is this to win an award? Or is this to elevate like little me or... So I feel like you talking about it from a people perspective is like I applaud that and I'm really appreciative of it because it reminds me 
of, um, of feeling the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it reminds me of that, like, that exuberance, like, for people. Because, like, we are in this together. Like, we really, really are. And, you know, there's this one, like, moment that's so tiny in the book that probably, I don't know, actually, maybe, maybe not. People might read and think, oh, and then move on. But there's a moment where I speak uh, lightly, briefly about, um, I guess, an abusive relationship I had. And everyone tried to get me to remove that from the book. So firstly, it was, I, I sent it to my family because, well, my parents didn't even know about that. And I spoke about my sisters because it all came, kind of came out of an argument we had where this moment that I, I wrote about, and of course I didn't want to say anything about them that they didn't consent to. So there was this kind of family level of people being like, you're not going to put that out there in the public domain, no way. Then there was this whole new conversation where my publishers, well, the legal review were kind of like, you can't say this because what if they sue you? I was like, I don't name them. And if they sue me, I'll fight them. Like, so what? It's true. What are they going to sue me for? And we had this huge, huge back and forth. And I obviously also didn't really, in a way, like, I actually didn't want it in the book. I was like, I don't want anyone to know that about me. I don't even want to think about that. I hadn't thought about it. Like, I thought about it for, like, the third time in my life when I wrote it. But then it became part of something bigger. I was just like, this, it became really, really, like, this isn't even about me anymore. This is just, this has to stay in the book because somebody's going to read that and think, I'm going through this exact same situation. It's going to be okay because, like, this person's written about it, and she's written about it in the context of like five women before her who, for various reasons, have found strength to move through a situation. Um, so you know, like, we yeah, we <laughs> we had a big fight, but I, we ended up reaching a compromise just by like removing. I think I removed the word university, so like it's not like a university boyfriend; it's just a boyfriend, a nameless times, so, and he could like he could never be identified and, and like I'd love him to I'd love him to to come and, and sue me and then I'll be like there you are you're outing yourself as like <laughs> I, bet, you, I yeah. bet you he's not gonna <laughs> he's not gonna come He'll be the probability the would be that he yeah. won't yeah but you know it's that feeling of like at what point does something stop being personal and start being yeah bigger than yourself yeah and how far do you go to protect that and fight for that I would get we yeah we could drink loads of Prosecco and talk about that <laughs> because um, I knew we were so connected. This is weird. Um, but the same thing in my book, in Open. Um, yeah, I wrote a very, very short bit about a toxic relationship that happened when I was a teenager. Um, and it, to the, to, still now, I wonder whether I should have done that. Because sometimes I feel really exposed. Um, but then in terms of the knock-on effect, like seven years later... I'm still proud of the fact that I wrote about that because the amount of young people yeah. that have looked at me in the eye and said, thank you. Mm -hmm. Like, look at you, you're in our school, you've written a book. How, like, mm -hmm. how would you get out of this? And I'm like, you can, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you thank for you. sharing <laughs> your vulnerability. Um, Cause we all have it. Do you know what I mean? In fact, I went to see an incredible work in progress just last week at the South Bank Centre. And it was of an opera um, based on the, the trope of the strong black woman. Um, and it's like, it's kind of non-verbal, it's sound. It's like really beautiful operatic, uh, like sensory experience by excellent singers, like a classically trained singer. Roxanne Tatai, like one of my favorite artists. Um, and the trope, like the kind of trope and aesthetic that it was all based on was like the water carrier, like the black, like, the, like you, you know, yeah, it's called the water carrier. When it goes to stage and it's not just a work in progress, it will be, I think, one of the, like, the greatest, like new operas, like that's progressive, I think. I think she's amazing. Um, but it was so emotional and so beautiful to, again it's this thing that we're describing like moving through like using like water as a theme um and being able to not even just always have the language 
which again, let's be honest, is an English language, <laughs> to be able to describe what it feels like to be a black woman. Because we're supposed to be strong. And we're not always strong. <laughs> of course not. Yeah. Of course not. And even then when you get to this, get to the water's edge, and then we're still not invited to belong in that in that space. And even that we're having to like jump in anyway and carve out a space. Ooh, as I love swimmers. cold water swimming. That helps I love me cold with that. Too. <laughs> the immer Oh yeah, you do, don't yes. you? Yes. I think that's how I connected yeah. with you in the first place. Oh, this is very nice. Um, I'm gonna maybe open up. Yeah, shall we chat? Yeah. Yeah. I'm having a lovely time. I really hope that you guys are as well and everybody watching um, on the live stream. I haven't forgotten you. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm a broadcaster. <laughs> I cast broadly. Um, <laughs> um, has anyone got any lovely questions or just things to say? We're going to do the more open mic stuff after a drink break, but like, yeah, let's ask questions. Why not? Catherine Joy White is in our city. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. I was um, quite interested to um, just hear you talk about all the different things you're doing. Um, and I have been reflecting with friends recently about the fact that I don't know any one black woman who only does one thing. Mm. Mm. And I, I don't know, I would just like to hear both your comments around what you think that might be about, is, is it, I've, I've, I've reflected on, could it be about security, you know? Um, we don't want other people to dictate when we can earn or not, so we like to have these options. That's just, you know, one idea that I thought I had. And then I started to think, perhaps is it us buying into this trope of the strong, black woman and kind of just going with, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that, you know. Because obviously, um, the more you do, the more of yourself you have to give. And sometimes there are consequences, burnout and things like that. So I'd just like to hear what you, what you think about that. Thank, Thank you. you, that's really lovely. Like a really interesting thing to talk about. And um, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> Every single word of that is true. And I think you've identified why. I think it's, I mean, we can look at it two ways, can't we? It's, it's both incredibly empowering. No one's gonna tell us what we're capable of. We are capable of so much more than anyone expects because nobody expects us to be able to be doing all of these things and be in all of these places and be successful and be thriving. But it's also that we have to work so much harder just to be taken, you know, a, a quarter as seriously. And I think that often translates as working that much harder in all of these different fields because probably one of them won't work out because there'll be a ceiling where we'll hit and we won't get any further. And I think the interesting thing is then how to, yeah, how do we reconcile these and make sure that if we are doing four or five different things and giving more of ourselves than we really can offer and making sure that doesn't impact our personal relationships, our health, as you rightly identify. I mean, I don't know about you and about you, Gemma, but you know, burnout's been, it's been real this year for me. It's, it's been real. Um, and what does that mean? Yeah, I don't want to, I want to make it to 30 and be like, I knew you were thriving. quite a lot younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 30's coming, don't you worry. 30's, 30's very close. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm excited for it. Yeah, I want to see it. I want to see it and I want to like be happy and energetic. You know, like how do we make sure that we are able to wake up each morning and release our shoulders and have energy for what we want to do? And I think that's, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. And it probably means, as you were saying, saying no and being able to say, that was really great while it lasted. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. I'm officially becoming your big sister now. I love this. I'm, happening. I'm sorry, that's it. I'm stepping in. <laughs> you buy me a drink later. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. We're going to keep swimming. <laughs> um, and there's a Kate Nash song from the first album, um, Made, in, Made of Bricks. 
um, called Dickhead. And it literally just goes, why are you being a dickhead for? Stop being a dickhead. It's actually secretly, I think I've, I have written about this in the book. Um, it's because I was moaning about a boyfriend that that song got written. <laughs> But it's really, really relevant that um, that song stays in our life. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Not just to do with like love, but just like probably more work or capitalism or Instagram. <laughs> so that's the first prescription. <laughs> um, okay, other questions? Oh, yeah, at the back. Take that, where's the hand? Hello. Will it reach? Oh, it will. Um, hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for giving so much of yourselves and coming to this event and participating. It's just been, it's been fantastic to watch you guys talk. Um, oh gosh, I had the question. I have the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was wondering if I could get a little, a little bit of advice about like, if you, if you want to be creative and you want to do and make things and also, you know, do that in a way that you don't have to worry about your material, like, concerns, like food and shelter and being able to take care of your health and stuff, what, what kind of resources or mindsets or, or people in your life do you think kept you afloat in those moments when you're still trying to, like, get a foot in the door and, and be able to get to that place where you can make things creatively and find that joy, but not have to like, when you're still, you know, doing quote unquote, the grind is, is cringing, cringingly being called, like, I don't know, stuff that offers comfort, I guess, when you're still in the middle of like, really trying to build something, I don't know. Yes, yeah, a really, really beautiful question and really beautifully put, thank you. Do you want to answer that? I mean, I'm just thinking because it's it's actually so important and it's the thing that no one ever really talks about because it's like, oh, you are creative and you just write a book and then it's, it's all, <laughs> you've, you've just written a book. It's like, well, no, how do you get to that point where you're able to write a book and who? how did you pay your rent in the meantime and <laughs> how did you eat? And I think it's really hard because my my number one point of advice is always to never work for free. Um, like if I take, for example, the uh, acting, where like it's catch 22, because you sort of need to get credits and work in order to be able to like get an agent if you can't like afford to go to drama school or you've already gone to uni, so you're not gonna then go to drama school. But how do you do that if, you, if you're not on someone's set? And often the way it starts is to do like, you know, student productions and unpaid stuff, but at the same time, you need to value your craft. So I think, that's that's not that this is long-winded but i think i would say about looking for ways that you can create on your own terms so for me in the really early stages that looked like writing like my own play maybe that i performed in a really like low-key context in like my local village hall with like you know kind of finding ways where it didn't feel like a burden on me financially and a burden on like my job that was paying the rent, but also didn't feel like it was a burden on the thing that I loved because the worst thing that can happen is when the thing that you love becomes your biggest anxiety. Um, and if you ever feel like you're getting to that point, I think it's also then to take a, a step back or take a step sideways and reframe it because that's your love and that's your passion and the, the, the rent paying job, the, the day job, is, is temporary. Um, and I think then connecting with organizations that are looking to support, you know, offering grants, and that's not gonna be the big, you know, the BFI, the Arts Council, it's gonna be small scale grants. Who's got 500 pounds for someone to develop their first play? Or who's looking to bring someone on set to shadow the cinematographer, and they're gonna pay you minimum wage, but you, you're gonna be able to get that first credit and get a foot in the door, so I think, yeah, uh, yeah, looking for the joy and looking for those places that will nurture that and not make it something that will, will turn you away from it, I suppose. I really love the idea of, like, it's like bringing things a bit more local somehow. Yeah. I don't know, like, metaphorically, yeah. you know, like that smaller pot. 
because I'm such a big gob, like things have got like my like visions go like that and I'm like, oh, and it starts to become quite heavy, <laughs> you know, like bigger budget, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, bigger amount of people, bigger yeah. scale. So I think having that like wax and wine or like the luxury actually yeah. that we can create for ourselves yeah. um, and remembering our inner value yeah. like um, is just a very powerful tool. Yeah. You know, like if you are, oh my goodness, I've been saying this recently as well. I've been, I've been quite on my high horse about this. If you are an artist, if you are a creative person, however, you, like whatever, noun you use as to your practice it's regardless to me I think that you're amazing and brave I, I, I just do um, I see art like very, as a very powerful tool I almost see it as like a healing tool yeah. sometimes I say salvation because for me it has been but like as, let's just go with the healing tool um, remember how much value you have so much value like, banks pay poets to make their adverts. <laughs> they know how powerful you are. And let's, let's, you know, let's not get it twisted. They make us angry, but they know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, your value is your creative mind um, and how that develops, how that changes which another thing I was going to say to you was nature. So for me, again, another thing that I would be as passionate about, um, nature is there for you no matter what. Yes, it has no mercy, but like we talked about cold water swimming. Like I could talk to you for hours about the immersion and how like cold water changed my life like, um, and the communities that I saw built within that. Um, no wonder you're so radiant. You're a mermaid. I'm a mermaid. Oh, I In met your a... green suit. <laughs> I met an amazing mermaid on the Isle of Mull. Um, in September, I went on a little jaunt on my own, got an electric bike, loved it, living my retirement dream. Um, <laughs> and there was someone at my B&B who was just so radiant, this, w this woman. And I was like, started talking to her in the library bit of the B&B. And she like s swam the length of Loch Ness. Right? She'd come over from San Francisco Bay. And I was like, I knew you were a mermaid. Like, you look, like, literally, the minute she walked into the b and I was like, there's something about that person. And then when she told me that, I was just like, oh! <laughs> yes, immortal sister. Um, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. Yes. I really mean it. Yeah. It's such a good question. Yeah. Go on, who's next? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you both for such a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. And I, more, mine's more of a comment than a question. I, I was just reflecting on what you said earlier about like self-care and also what you said about the opera, about like the strong black woman trope. And I think it's going to be so interesting. Like I'm an aunt, I'm also a niece. And it's interesting, like my age gap with my auntie is the same age gap as between my niece and I. So whenever I have discussions, I'm like, oh gosh, when my niece gets to my age, I'll be at my auntie's age and blah, blah, blah. And I try to imagine like what the world would be like for my niece as a young black woman. And I hope that we have these images of well-rested black women that she can look up to. Because I look at my parents, my mom is a parent, a wife, the head in her church, she's a school governor, she's a professional. I'm like, girl, when do you rest? Yeah. <laughs> like I get to the house, she's cooking up everybody's favorite meals. And I'm like, no, just like sit down, like put your feet up. And it's that thing of like the first contributor said, it's like every black woman I know is spinning so many plates. And it's like, how do we, almost like, how do we disarm black women? Not in like a disempowering way, but yeah. how do we just say, rest is okay. Like you're allowed to sit down. You don't have to be super productive, the best cook, the best this, all of this, like there's just so much we have to be. Yeah. But yeah, I'm hoping that things change because I'm, I'm having to learn about rest after a few years ago experiencing burnout myself and then you yeah. kind of get to that, no thank you, it's okay, yeah. I'm not coming. Or actually I said I was going to come, but I woke up this morning and it's a no. <laughs> and it's so liberating because when you turn up, people know you want to be there. Yeah. 
instead of actually just being like, oh, I should go because that person came to my birthday four years ago or they were, <laughs> they were at my christening. <laughs> or there was that one time my parents migrated to this country and they, you know, they helped them out. <laughs> They'll probably be okay without me being there. Like, they're going to be fine. <laughs> so, yeah, those are just my reflections. I hope we do move from this, like, strong black woman to having more of these, like, well-rested, radiant, mermaid black women that we can learn from and kind of be inspired by. So, yeah, thank you both so much. That's really beautiful. So thank beautiful. you. That's so nice. Oh, it's I want to so, cry. I know. Oh, and it God. does also show that, like, just talking about that, because honestly, hearing you say that, I'm like, I feel inspired to rest. Like, hearing you say that is like, that's enough for me. And then probably us then saying that will be enough for someone else. Like, that is the most powerful thing and beautiful thing. And that is probably how we'll change it. I t I, and it is interesting as well when you try and put it into practice because, yes, it's liberating and people... I love what you said about people knowing that you really want to be there. Yeah. And actually, I think I'm starting to discover that now that I've moved up to Scotland as well. Because like, it's a bit easier to get around. I don't know, something's happening that I can relate to that. Um, but it's taken a little while. And also, it, what it does is it brings into really clear focus who is an enemy of your progress. <laughs> Who is an op? Right? Like, hmm. <laughs> I've worked for a lot of institutions. Um, and it's been an interesting discourse, let's say. Again, to be polite and keeping it light, because it's Friday night. Um, and, yeah, but not everybody wants us to be liberated, but why are you being a dickhead for? <laughs> Also, we can like, hang out, you know what I mean? Like, when we create community, that's where the safety is. Like, this idea, like somebody was talking to me yesterday about the idea of mutual aid, like the actual essence of mutual aid. I was like, oh, thank you for reminding me of that as a concept, because I think probably I am drawn to try and create this sense of peace or healing. Uh, do you follow um, the NAP ministry? Yes. Yeah. Have you, got, have you got her book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I just bought it on the way, because I moved to Scotland like, sa on Saturday, so I bought it for the train. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm new here. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Welcome! You come to the right place. It's the best place to be on a Friday night. Honestly, I've done all the haunts now of Edinburgh, and this is the one. <laughs> Um, well, on Sunday, I'm actually hosting a yoga class, like for a very, very small group of people. Um, I've got a shop space in the Meadows area. I'm going to give you my number in the break, and you can come if you want. Oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my friend who is a yoga instructor wants to be able to kind of create a practice that is responsive to how we might be feeling in our bodies, so creating resilience in our bodies, yeah. And I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> if you're still here on of Sunday, course, come. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We just literally just like burn some candles and just have a stretch and be quiet. It's lovely. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. It's so new for me. I did years of breakfast radio. Are you crazy? I can literally talk in my sleep and present a radio show and be like, and here's One Direction. <laughs> Harmful. <laughs> in a joke. Um, <laughs> um, any other questions? The lack of sleep bit's harmful. Pop music is great. <laughs> Making you run shuffles. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you guys so much. It's been, it's been amazing. I am utterly charmed um, <laughs> by you both. I'm glad we had a minute for the suits earlier. Otherwise, I would insist on that now. But um, I wanted to pick up on the horror point. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you were going to come back to it. I mean, I know you might have to keep a few things mysterious. But if you can talk at all about, like, the upcoming project... Um, but also, I guess, picking up on maybe frustrations with horror as it currently is, where you would see like an elevated kind of horror going and the kind of stories you feel like would be served by the, the genre. And I'll stop there because that's already a lot. Are of you a horror fan? I've had like an evolved, um, evolved, uh, like a changing relationship with it. Um, like I started off hating horror. Like I had to leave our like year five showing of the farm safety video because it was too scary. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Bless you. Yeah, r rural girl. Country bumpkin, <laughs> um, but kind of, yeah, grown to love it more as a, a genre as I've got older. 
I saw actually Kirsty Logan a few weeks ago talking about horror as like, yes, at a lighthouse event, shameless promo. <laughs> um, and she kind of explained it as like a genre for people who like to address things, which I thought was like a really, really interesting take on it. And obviously not all horror kind of meets that purpose all the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a cool way of looking at it. And I'm talking way too much, so I'm gonna hand this back. No, it's cool. No, yeah, thank yeah. you. This is, what, this is why we like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Friday night. <laughs> yes. um, never apologize for talking too much. I'll be apologizing way too much if I, <laughs> the AI me doesn't apologize. let's get into it because I think that's exactly it people who like to address things and that was when I was properly like it felt like a light bulb had just gone like haywire in my head because yes so the, the maybe I'll backtrack the film that got me excited about the possibilities of horror is um, I hope I can say this it's not come out yet but it's like I got m married off it's a period piece and I get married off to this you know sort of master of the house type character who, as it transpires, has been killing and eating his wives. And what ends up happening, let's just say, is that I somewhat turn the tables. And it was the most, like, let me tell you, and also I'm a vegetarian, so like, I was eating fake, <laughs> it's like marzipan. <laughs> but that moment of like, yeah, and you know, he, it, it's got the whole the whole story, and he also is abusive and blah blah. But that moment of like eating him <laughs> was like, and it was. I forgot. Not that, of course, that's what should happen as an actor. But I forgot. I forgot. I lost myself. I was like hysterically laughing, and then I just was like sobbing and sobbing. I I will never forget that moment. It was the most extraordinary. Like hour on set that I think I've ever had of just being like it's catharsis I've never I can't explain it to anyone that I've never felt such a sense of release and yeah justice and it just opened like every single I just got really excited and then I kind of looked a bit more into horror and of course then you do have I saw like yeah, Get Out, which I hadn't seen at the time. I was way after the hype. Oh, and my I God. Saw Get Out. Lamar, I literally had my, my roll neck yeah. jumper over my, like... Yeah. It's, I was like... It's not... Yeah. yeah. I, that's the thing. I'm still not a horror fan, but I, like, I understood and got it and was it excited by it on an intellectual level. So... But we don't really have that, you know, from the sort of story that I want to tell. Um, I don't know how much I can... Oh, this is getting really exciting now, isn't it? <laughs> I think I'm going to start liking horror. Yes. We can oh. come back with okay, okay, can I be mermaids? Yeah, <laughs> we can be horror. Actually. Actually. All right, cool. <laughs> what star sign are you? Uh, Taurus, but I'm like, okay. I was born on that absolute cusp where Taurus and Gemini meet. I okay. Like 11.59 p.m. Okay, So if okay. I was like one minute later, I'd be a Gemini. Ooh. Sure. Yeah, what does that mean? If I was like a few hours later, I'd be an Aries. Yay! Um, <laughs> but I'm a fish. I'm two fish who are very conflicted. <laughs> and that's all right. <laughs> um, shall we have a break? Yeah. Um, I'm going to get a Prosecco. <laughs> let's do it. Let's um, all get a Prosecco. Yeah, let's, and then basically what we'll do is we're going to have a, a beautiful performance by um, a poet who we met earlier and just like made me feel really excited because we were all like, oh, yes, poetry. Um, Georgia Bartlett McNeil will be performing on stage. Um, I know that um, some of you have got some stuff prepared, but hey, hopefully we've like released it together and maybe you are inspired to just come up and make noises. <laughs> my, one of my friends sent me um, the Yoko Ono reaction to when Trump got uh, elected, and it's just like an amazing noise. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> for ages, and it was good. <laughs> so if you feel like doing that, I'm fine with it. <laughs> um, see you in a bit. <laughs>
Here we go. If you are performing, if you want to make sure you're on the end of an aisle or in one of the free seats at the front, that'll make it easy to come up. Uh, if you're performing and you are uncomfortable with some steps that do not have a handrail, then give me a wee wave and I can take you around the back, which is totally fine. Um, do you ever have a nice break? Yeah, sort of. You're just ready to be back in it. Yeah, almost, almost. Come on, have we got, is that everyone? Almost everyone? All right, gorgeous. So just to, to get the room warmed up, and before we hand over to uh, RMC, uh, I will get you all to put your hands together for her. But first, um, for whoever is using the mic, it is adjustable by twisting this and moving it up and down. <laughs> so that's how that works. Uh, all right, so now, would you please put your hands together for our host for the rest of the evening, Gemma Kearney. Now that I know that Catherine is also Jamaican, like, definitely I'm having a Prosecco. Yeah. Right? I, oh, that's going to happen. Not necessarily tonight, but maybe in Jamaica. Yeah. Um, it's actually fitting. Um, if, a trigger, if trigger warnings are still a thing these days, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I often found myself wondering whether that is still a thing. Maybe that's just my BBC thing. But. Um, this is quite a fiery poem. <laughs> um, and it's from my new book called The Immortal Sisterhood. And I think I mentioned that earlier. It comes out next year. I'm still in the stage of feeling like, about it. <laughs> like covers and stuff. Honestly, I know that seems fun. And it did feel really romantic um, when I first became an author with Open. And I quickly realized that I'm an obsessive. And that I love the written word. And that I'd always wanted to write a book. And... It's been a real love affair, um, writing has. It's changed my life, actually. Like, I'm not a presenter anymore. Like, I'm not even really a broadcaster, even though I cast broadly. <laughs> um, I'm a writer. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels really scary and amazing. Um, so this book is about 12 women um, who speak to me, which makes it sound far too mystic, Meg. Um, but they sort of came into my orbit and they couldn't not be the women in my book anymore. The more I researched, the more I loved them, the more they became my friends. Um, and they are real women who have lived or are living um, and they're from everywhere, different times, from a genderless uh, pharaoh in ancient Kemet, a.k.a. Egypt, um, to Grace Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Who also changed my life, um, because I was lucky enough to be in a lifetime where I got to interview her over dinner. I've had one of the only other times that I've had like a little drink whilst working, because when you're sat with Grace Jones, and she offers you a wine, and she's eating prawns. Like, what do you do? Like, I'm not an interviewer anymore. <laughs> um, and she said something amazing to me, actually, about, about, cause I said, I don't really drink when I'm working. And she said, oh, darling. She was like, white to be all right, red for bed. And I was like, all right. <laughs> I'll have a sancerre then, please. Anyway, that's all in the book. Um, and another Jamaican sister of ours as well, yeah. And a swimmer, she loves swimming, yeah. Oh my God, now I have to tell the anecdote. I'm sort of like, it's like spoilers for the book, but there's loads more. Um, uh, yeah, I was talking to her about swimming and she was speaking about swimming so beautifully and then I just was in awe of her and uh, I said, don't you get scared? Like swimming in all these beautiful, like, 
waters, you know, in these tropical places where there are potentially, like, prey in the water. And she said, oh, no. If I saw a shark, I'd just punch him in the nose. <laughs> and she was being serious. She weren't doing it for laughs. So I was just like, you're just absolutely to your core brilliant. Um, okay. <clears throat> So I decided at certain points of writing that I may be a rust to beat poet. <laughs> and when I was writing about Mary Seacole, is she in your book? Okay, okay. I'm going to read your book, and I'm excited. <laughs> I'm really excited. Literally, I've got it on my shelf, and I'm like, I need to finish my book before I open this book. That's, that's what's happening with that. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm just like, like, I'm sort of so in awe that you've written this book. Um, the threads are so real, it's mad. Um, uh, and then one day I was like, oh, I can't get out this like rage or sadness like that I'm feeling for the way that Mary Seacole was treated. And she literally saved the lives of so many people, most of them white men. Um, like how could they not uplift like her, just her like dedication and fortitude and care so I had to rust a beat poet it out. Rebirth, reform, rebirth, reform. The sound of the R's continue in a cacophony in my mind. The more I look at the map of what the indigenous named their island Jamaica. Rebirth, reform, rebirth, reform, responsibility comes up in the rhythm of the rust a beat poet who spends and have spent lives creating new pathways. I thank my elders and feel so lucky to be alive now, but the R's don't quieten down. Rebirth, reform, rebirth, reform. I think of the symbolism of what we know to be royal, the British Empire, the celebrations of castles and a crown. Rebirth, reform. I think of the storm and lightning bolts that I watch bounce off the English Channel Sea outside my bedroom window the night that the British press clambered to get a picture of another royal baby. Rebirth, reform. I think about how I'm yet to have a baby and how I'll etch out a more Nubian version of alternative histories and kingdoms beyond this map's traces if I do. I think about the odes to earth in reggae music Rebirth, reform, I bow my head and bounce in honour of the wordplay and poetry of Patois. Rebirth, reform, I see new roots. Reclamation, rewilding lands. Words dance brightly, the R's still roll, new civilizations. Reparations. Thank you. Thank you. That is only the second time I've done that in a microphone. Ooh! The first time I was so lucky, I was joined on stage by Simone Seals. I don't know if you're aware of Simone. Oh, just, just another, another like small sibling of mine, like. Um, yeah, who I'm very glad to have met, and I met them at a book event uh, with another Jamaican writer <laughs> in Scotland. And uh, Simone's become like in my farm here in Scotland, and they play cello incredibly and improvise. And they literally sat there and like played the cello whilst <laughs> I got to do that. So yeah, amazing. Um, next year's gonna get weird, and I'm so fucking excited. <laughs> Because we're going to do a show as well. We're going to do a live version of Immortal Sisterhood. Yeah. So watch this space. Um, okay. Heritage. Are we ready? Is it her? How do I say this? Yeah. Yeah, you're being a Rasta Beat poet. That's okay. <laughs> um, Georgia Bartlett. McNeil, everybody! steal my seat until I've got to get it back again. Hi everyone, happy Friday. Um, I wrote a book. 
who knew I could write a book, but I'm going to share some poems from the book that I wrote with you, and I hope you enjoy it. On the theme of the night, it's mostly about the women in my family breaking the Jamaican trend. We're from Trinidad and Tobago, slightly further south. I know, I know. Not quite as cool, but, you know, I'm sure we'll get over it. So I've got four poems for you. The first three are to do with the women in my family, and the last one is a little bit of something special. So the first one is called Four Women. The women in my family are stubborn. The women in my family are all bark and all bite. The women in my family are strong. The women in my family shine bright through me, through our direct line. There are four of us, all held together, standing single file, eldest daughter to eldest daughter to only child, represented by golden thread. We are queens. I tell my stories and I tell our tales with permission given because to ask is courtesy. Our history is too full of people taking, so I refuse to add weight to the hypocrisy. I am the tip of our collective tongue. I am the mouth of us that speaks, but I am twig stemmed from branch, branch from limb, from limb, from. In our family tree, my mother and I are lighter bark grafted onto darker skin, but we do not go without casting our own long shadows. We are four women that span an entire century. My great-grandmother, Elaine, born November 1920, or thereabouts, my nana does not remember. My nana, Myrna, born November 9, 1940, loving and giving. My mother, Deborah, born October 1964, fair of face. And me, Georgia, born November 1994, full of grace. <laughs> or maybe that rhyme was a lie for its time. <laughs> We are four women, two dragons, a monkey, and a dog. Not Aunt Sarah, Sophronia, Sweet Thing, or Peaches, as Nina once sang, though we carry stories like theirs within us. We are four great rivers leading into the oceans of our family. We nourish, we feed, we run rapid and wide, white foam atop dark beds, home for many things that go unseen, distilled like good whiskey. Cut from a template we could only grow outwards from. No interest in being withheld from our birthrights or our heritage. Four scorpions of fixed modality, bejeweled with both pincers and stings. Small in stature, yes, but mighty. Thank you. So, um... So, as, as I mentioned, my, my nana and my mum take, um, take pride of place in this book. Uh, when I told my nana I was going to write a book and I'd written a poem about her and I asked her if she minded if I put it in the book, she said, Georgia, I don't care. <laughs> so I put it in, and so this is for my nana, and it's, it's just called Myrna. And I suppose it harkens back to the whole idea that um, Catherine and Gemma were talking about in their, in their talk about black women spinning loads of different plates. And the women in my family do that a lot, but none more so than my nana. <clears throat> Eldest of seven birthed in flame, palms soft, fingers like twisted copper wire, unbreakable. No verdigree to be spotted, no, she is all brown and shining. Her nails, sharp like barbs, always painted when I was young, less so now. I always promise to paint them when I visit, but somehow never find the time. Perpetual matriarch, though my grandfather's voice drowns her song. She is well practiced at hissing silences back through her teeth. She's a magician in that it never looks like she's sucking lemons, but I know her tongue is stinging when instead it should be singing. Beaten down, but never beaten. Nurse, bank worker, wife, mother, nana. Call her encyclopedia, it'll save time. Came over from the Caribbean in the 60s with nothing, and though they didn't come together, she and my grandfather built an empire of us. Her name means beloved, and she is. Middle name means queen, and she is. Through her, my family is royalty. In features, I think I take more after her. Bypass my mother in one way or another somehow. Myrna, my nana, blessed me with my cheeks, my smile, the shape of my face, the shape of my eyes. Her eyes 
are brown encircled by blue. As my mother ages, she is developing this too. I hope I follow in their footsteps in this, if nothing else. Nana always said that they are the eyes of the Queen of Sheba. She very rarely told me stories that didn't come from the Bible, too full of tales of men and whales, of women turning to pillars of salt for looking backwards when they ought not to have done, but that one always stuck. I am struck by her beauty still, though age has done a number on her. Her thinning crown no less elegant, though she and her sister help it along with polish. A titanium hip injected new strength that left her lopsided and limping. But she still walks and whines, dances and dines. Her skin is not so full. A teddy bear pressed too tightly into so many pairs of tiny hands it has forgotten what its own body looks like. Her flesh sags when she holds me. She pinches at my waist, my thighs, my ass. She says, I have inherited too much of her mass. She prays that I can lose it. And all I want, all I want is for her to take it back. Thank you. So uh, we're, working, we're working our way through the women in my family. So the next pit stop is my mother. Um, when, I told my, when I told my mom I wrote her a poem and it was going in the book, she said, Georgia, I don't care. <laughs> see, that, see, that joke is so funny. It lands both times I do it. Um, so this is, this is a poem from my mom. My mom is just, she's just, she's just Deborah. She wears poison. Pure, hypnotic, cloaked in midnight. See, she is a bumblebee draped in wolf's clothing. Sting in the tail that won't kill her if she uses it. And believe me, I know. Growls with every other wing beat. Buzzes with bared teeth. Determined to be slightly crooked despite the intervention of Invisalign. In our family, we're all a little off center. And you can't improve upon perfection anyway. So time reverts her to her natural state. Fast approaching 60. Too quickly for me, a stark reminder of my own mortality, but she's not aged past 43 since I was in my teens. Born in October 1964, but unlike the Beatles, she never wants to hold your hand. That's not how she shows her love. Hers is a strange thing, and I am still learning what it looks like. Deborah. My mother, so vast I named her an entity, middle child, top dog, overachiever, trailblazer, fire starter, twice bought her own engagement ring when she was getting married to my father. She always said I was the best thing that came from either of them, the best of both of them. Her hairline is relinquishing its melanin whilst her skin holds tight to it. She dyes the roots as well as the edges, mixes mulatto shades with honey stays sweet in her way. Which is to say she is spicy like a Trinidad scorpion pepper, which is to say she will burn you if you are not careful. Some days you have to handle her with gloves. Some days you better not look. Some days you better not touch. Hell, some days you better not enter the goddamn room. And I took so much from her. So much she never gave, either willingly or otherwise. We share our eyes, our ears, our mannerisms, our hot tempers. That's the fire in us that goes all the way back. We can't plot the map as far as we'd like, but that's the curse of our blessing, of our black. I half lied. Earlier, I mean, she doesn't never want to hold your hand, but her hands are sacred. To be held by them is to be made holy, to be remade holy. I remember being 10 years old in Tobago, the home of our recent ancestors, our birthright, where a street bears our name and the sign glows in the sunlight. We walked down the sands of Topaz Beach, blazing the color of opals and citrine. We walked into the Caribbean Sea and she held my hand as we counted the steps. One, two, three, until we reached a finality. 207, waves forcing kisses into our bodies like they were almost sorry that they had a hand in bringing our people here. And she turned to me and said, this is the world, the whole world, 
at your hands and at your feet. I've made all I can for you. I give it all to you. Now take it and make it yours. Thank you. So um, I've got one more poem and then I'll make way to what I'm sure is gonna be some fabulous open micers. Um, back in July um, and over the course of the beginning of this year, a great Edinburgh-based group of poets called The Loud Poets did a, um, a slam series that they ran across Scotland. Um, it culminated in a show at the, um, in this, at the International Book Festival, but I won the Edinburgh and Central Belt uh, Regional, and I, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the poem that I did to win the, that regional slam was an abridged version of this poem, and because you're all on my time, you're gonna, you're gonna get the, the full unabridged poem, so strap in, guys. <clears throat> this is a man's world. This is a man's world. But it wouldn't be nothing, nothing. I bumble along through the world of online dating, hoping somewhere I'll meet my perfect match. At every failed conversation, I find myself saying, okay, Cupid, it doesn't matter. I know I'm a catch and there's plenty of fish in the sea. Anyway, keep gathering, kindling, searching for Tinder, bashing the rock and the hard place together, trying to create a spark that'll catch, build a bonfire of love that won't be over in a flash or look more meaningful to me than to the person on the other side of the app. I fucking hate this! But they say nothing in this world can take the place of persistence, so nevertheless, I persist. Continue to plaster my prettiest pictures on the digital pin boards and hope I'm someone's pick. Hope that the next person I speak to isn't a prick or isn't feeding me just the right words to try to get me to sit on his dick. I might be a hopeless romantic. I might be hopelessly naive, but I'm not thick. I've fallen for that nonsense one too many times already and I'm quite keen not to see another repeat of the trick. At this point, I'm simply unhinged. I thought I was an elite single, my own flat, my own car, a good education, a good job. Plus I have all my own teeth and I'd like to think I have a fairly decent personality and where that fails, I have a really cute kitten and I have so many hobbies. I play sports and do poetry. I play video games, I watch movies, I play four instruments, I do photography, but somehow that's still not good enough for someone to want to make a life with me. I have well-meaning friends that say, just go and get laid, but that's not my style, that isn't really me. I can't throw myself at the first person I see, lie back, spread my legs and scream for them to just take me. I need a connection with some <clears throat> e-harmony. And I can accept that I will not be everyone's cup of tea. I'm too loud, too chatty, too soft, too curvy. Excessive is the best word you could probably use to describe me. I'm an independent, badass, boss bitch with a, a hint of needy. I'm kind and I'm smart and I'm honest and I'm strong, but if that's not your thing, then don't string me along, don't get my hopes up, then ghost me when I've given you what you wanted as if you had a right to it or not accept a no as a valid answer because come on baby, we're young baby, we've got nothing better to do baby, I said no! I said no. I said my body is too sacred. I'm trying so hard to unlearn my intrinsic hatred of it. It is too precious a thing for me to give to you, only for you to return it if it doesn't fit the way you thought it would, the way you thought it should. So here's a little tidbit. You can have this one on me. I do not exist to bridge the gap between what you want and who you need. Man may have made everything, but man sure as fuck didn't make me. And in case you didn't know it, hell hath no fury like the scorned woman who sits upon the throne of it. And I'm sick to the back teeth of this bullshit patriarchy. I do everything I'm told to do despite my better judgment because God forbid I spend my life lonely. I sell myself out in the hope that someone will want me, try to turn myself into an ideal product, because what good am I if not for consumption for someone who doesn't even look like me. I was 10 years old when I was told no one would ever want me unless I made myself prettier. Your eyes are too small, Georgia. Your cheeks are too round. The thing about a good woman is that she never makes a fucking sound, so stay quiet and skip lunch, or if not lunch, then skip dinner, because you can always do with being just a little bit fucking thinner decades later. I'm still gazing at myself in mirrors, eyes full of an apology I dare not utter, for to speak of it is to admit to failure. Instead, 
I daub myself in the war paint that was hand me down, hand fucking made for me. And that is still not good enough. Because no matter what I achieve on my own, to some people, to most people, it counts for nothing unless there's someone else standing beside me. This is a man's, man's, man's world. But it wouldn't be nothing, nothing, not one little thing without a woman or a girl. Okay. <laughs> Scotland is a serious place. Yeah. Um, there are many reasons why I ended up in Scotland, and I'm reminded all the time that was another moment. You're incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs> Georgia Bartlett, McNeil, Heritage. I love that we got to experience that together. Um, everybody buy the book and we can get it signed, yeah? yeah. And um, in the show that I'm creating, there's a revolving part, which is a kind of like in-house poet. Um, so when it comes to Scotland, please will you be that person, please? <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's got to happen, like, wow, wow, wow. It would be such a, an honor to introduce you on stage in that way, because um, you are in the Immortal Sisterhood. <laughs> um, wow! <laughs> I'm having a really great night. Um, okay, so over to you. Uh, I'm, I'm just so intrigued as to like what beautiful box has been opened um, and for your creativity to shine. So we're gonna start with Mandy Amo. Hello. Hello. Um, I've got two pieces, and I hope that's okay, because I think that's within my time range. And this is the first time I've performed this one. Um, I wrote this piece at a writing workshop when I needed to write myself something a little bit loving. So I'll start there. And I've actually never performed it before, so yeah. <laughs> if I was meeting you for the first time, I wouldn't be able to tell that you are as mad as a box of frog. You seem to be able to keep that part of you at bay, long enough to weed out the wheat from the chafe, sometimes. Other times, you just let it all out. You're ambitious and adventurous, and even though you have your doubts, you are always in the right place at the right time. Your spirit is a nomadic, and it amazes me how you always seem to find ways to ground yourself, how you always find ways to allow yourself to take root and flourish and fly and fly and be free and fly some more and take root. You juxtapose a life of freedom and adventure with deep roots so effortlessly, always taking root in love, in intimacy, intelligent connection and radical honesty, fighting the weeds of hatred, of bigotry, conformity, of dogma, here today, determined to find the next big adventure tomorrow. Darling, remember to take your time and breathe. Reach for the wine and breathe again. Take a big swig if that's what you need today. This is your inner best friend speaking, the one that you really need to hear from today. Chanda Guinira. I forgot to say it's bilingual. <laughs> Chanda Guinira, the determined one, the stubborn one, in your own way and in your own time. Chanda Guinira, that's the way it's always been. Tete tells you that you arrived eight days late at lunchtime. It was a Friday. You were 4.1 kilos. Poor mum. Her blood pressure was through the roof. They had to get you out via C-section. Gogo, 
prayed and fasted and prayed some more, held hands with other women from church. She stayed nearby the night before. In 12 hours, a bright pink knitted hat you wore. She sang celebratory hymns. Diani aronga kudai, dimari kanaka. Diani aronga kudai, dimari kanaka. Gogo said she knew God would deliver you and Mama safely, the girl who came in her own time, Chanda Gwinira. Remember your origin story. You are your ancestors' wildest dreams. Born free, born of love. Born free, born of love. Born well, born of love. You are Mbuya's music. My guru's attention to detail, mama's determination, Gogo's intelligence, Vatete's feistiness, Judy's affection and haughty humor, mama's potatoes, Shadow's zestiness for the world, and your darling niece's affection. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and the second piece, if I can just pull it up is a piece that I wrote during a time that I felt the world had gone crazy, which I think it has, but I felt I was losing my mind a little bit. And I think the theme of tonight that I really picked up on was on moving through something. So I was moving through what I felt was just genuine, just madness in the world. But also at the time I was supporting a family member who was moving through the mental health system, which is underfunded and just not a really great person for black body. It's like just, you know, non-white, not just anyone to be in really. So the conversations we had in parallel to just my own experience that I was moving through um, informed this piece or inspired this piece. And it's called an interrogation of the old self. I look back at old self, old self and her old loves, her old laugh, so deep, so carefree, so mischievous. Old self and her old chaos. I feel attached to old self even as I let her go because the old self is in hindsight so funny, so coherent, so measured, so graceful, so eloquent. Hindsight is 2020, they say. Funny, I never saw that brilliant girl. Maybe my vision's never been that clear. I was taught to walk through the world, through a blurry world with wide open eyes, taking too much in to fill in the gaps, seeing what wasn't there, glossing over inconvenient rough edges and ugly truths. It's a way of surviving. Surviving, as I've learned, is the only way old self can arrive at new self. To arrive at new self or at new selves is to arrive at new joys, new hurts, new cuts and bruises. To arrive at new self is to arrive at new love, new laughter, new troubles. Without a new self, there is nothing. I feel attached to both old and future self, even as I let them both go and embrace this self, or at least try to embrace this self. But... Old self, new self, future self, an elusive trio, fraternal triplets, sisters together, cross paths occasionally, leaving me windswept. I wonder if the pills are a gateway to the new self or a way to allow me to integrate old self with the current self. The talking, the feelings, the pill popping, a meeting of old self and new self, both projecting into future selves. An over-reliance on old, new and future selves leaves me adrift dancing on a ribbon. When I dance, I see glimpses of new self. I hear her new words, feel her pleasures, her joys, her neuroses, her perfections, and her imperfections. Are these feelings that I write about, talk about, think about, talk about some more, the feelings of the old self or the new? What is the shelf life of any version of self, new or old? Sometimes, I'm tempted to think that one of the old selves was the best self. The most reliable self I can think of oscillates between one version of the selves that has been and gone. But then I wonder, what of all the incarnations of future selves? The unraveling of the self is frightening, illuminating, lacerating. What stays, what goes? The laughter, the tears, the love for lukewarm cups of tea, the, the long showers, the lovers in the night, they always go. The unraveling of the self is frightening, illuminating, lacerating. It is liberating, exhausting, poetic. It has no rhythm or rhyme. It is loud. It is quiet. It is a cry for help. 
It is five more minutes in bed, which ends up being five days in bed. A diminishing number of missed calls, a song on repeat. Today will be the day. The running shoes sit strategically at the foot of the bed, unassuming and anticipating at the same time. Today is not the day to just do it. Neither is tomorrow. Talking about feelings and popping pills does not make you your old self. It makes you functional, not fun just functional. Most of the times you don't feel fun, but you say things that the old self might have said, and you hear others laugh. This is fun adjacent. Sometimes lovers of different variations will message you, and, they say, and they'll say they thought of something you once said, and how funny it was. Something old self, the funny old self said, you correct them in your head. They'll send you pictures of their aubergines. The old joke is still not funny. Even in the season of abundance, new self doesn't want to fuck the new versions of these old men. Old self and her old ways, the old ways of making love, the old ways of holding on for too long and too short a time. Old self has made way for new self, an emotive self, a feeling self. New self is raw and tender. New self is fuller and rounder. New self is soft and strong. New self doesn't wear her glasses because she doesn't care what time the bloody bus is coming or what the model plastered on the billboard is trying to sell. How much younger looking in how many days? When I look in the mirror, I wonder who is looking back at me. Am I looking at old self with new eyes or am I looking at new self with old eyes? Old self makes reasonable requests of future self. Speak more slowly. Wait your turn even when it hurts to do so. Be present. The fairies will wait for your interlocutor to finish their sentence. Don't laugh at his unfunny jokes. I know, I know now that old self is not suitable for this new reality. This isn't an interrogation of the old self, it's an integration of the new self. Thank you. <laughs> Mandy Ammo, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, you moved to Edinburgh. I like all selves. <laughs> um, Hannah Murphy, hello. Hi. Thank you guys so much tonight. It's been really fun. I've got my new favorite poet and my new favorite phrase, which is fun adjacent. Yes. Um, sorry, I've gone analog. <laughs> and it's not this long, don't worry. It's uh, I thought if I kept it thick, you wouldn't be able to see like the, the tremor. Because this is my, my first time reading something since I think drama GCSE. Guys, 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 no, I got a D in the final exam. <laughs> yeah, you're not in for a dream, but uh, yeah, no, um, this is a little story about a dream, um, but it's basically about like me and my grandma, like we, I feel like we don't connect a lot of the time, but we have the same values, which is kind of like the, the conversation that unfolds, but yeah, um, ooh, got a little tremor, let's go. Um, at night, sometimes, I meet the women who came before me. They cross space and time and reason and credulity to sit with me as I dream. I cannot call them when I wish. They come and go when they please, as they should and as I hope to. Last night, I was blessed by a visitor. She sat with me in a meadow. The sun stayed, just settled on the horizon, impossibly secured in a gentle embrace with the very edge of this dream world. The clearing held onto the sunlight of the late day like a hot coal, glowing with blazing oranges, oranges and pinks. My fingers, they flex soft on damp grass, thick as a nest, and they twisted in it gleefully. Four leaf clovers, woven with something I recognized from my grandmother's garden, brought a springy tapestry, so soft under bare feet. The place, for surely it must be a place, was heavy, rich, there was a weight to the air that made my hair twist and my skin pull with little shivers and then finally glow. I could feel it in each breath, pushing the oil and the debris out of my lungs that had settled there in my teenage years. 
it emerged and evaporated into sweet coils of vapor, like smoke from burned incense. She sat with me in her dresses, great, billowing pale sheets against verdant green earth and orange sky. She asked me about this modern life. She said that she does not know how we live in this odd new century. She asked me if the bright lights ever hurt, if all the noise was ever too much. Sorry, guys, too many papers. I told her it was fine, that some noises are better than others, and that I am almost always warm. She poked at my trousers then, so different from her skirts. She asked me how I like them, those men's things. Men's things, but queer things, so tight in places that surely I can no longer run as I should, and can no longer squat to pee where I need. And now, do I not have to negotiate these small little buttons, hooks, and angry, angry metal teeth that must bite my hands when they're too cold and too numb from missing the warmth of my shawl and the deep, th the deep thick heat of a hearth and the bodies normally in my bed? Oh, my bed. She asked me how I sleep now. How I am told I am to sleep now. Is it that wrong to entwine myself with others, to lose ourselves and share our heat? One to a bed, they say now unless you mean to do something adult. She asked me why I'm told it means dirty, sexual things to share your sleep with another, only to be done with some and not too many, or else I'll be a different, less important type of woman. She asked, am I not cold? And is my skin not lonely? And does it not long for touch in this strange, sterile century? We sat in the meadow a while longer. The sun, the sun stayed in its impossible place. She told me that the noise is different now and asked me if I knew to miss the sounds that had been before. I asked her what noise. She told me to listen. If you stay a while longer, she said, you can hear the birds sing. So we sat another while longer. A small and soft and velvety current thrummed over and through me. The pleasant pressure of the place pushed down on our aching muscles, and winding knots that had become part of my architecture. The twists in my stomach that had become so integral to me, I could only know them from their absence. A canopy started to, form, started to form. I looked over to her, and she smiled that it was all right, that this was her gift. So I stayed, and I watched, and I listened. It was thick and green and dappled with fading sunlight, marbled in gold. When it was time to go, I held her gaze and her hand. I woke to tears on my pillow and a kiss on my cheek. The birds were singing outside my window. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you. Congratulations as well. Such a beautiful thing to do. And really beautiful imagery that you took us. I was just like, a meadow with oranges. Yeah. Also, your grand sounds cool. Um, next, we've got Beth Godfrey. Hello. Hello. Um, I sorry, I'm really I'm really breathless tonight. <coughs> so cold. Um, there was a series of years of many protests. I think you remember Brexit and Trump, and um, and then Boris Johnson got into power, and I just I wrote this poem because I was just kind of done, <laughs> done. And I actually, sharing it now with what's going on in the world, I'm like, do I, do I still agree with this? Um, because I've never been very good at anger or comfortable with it, but I also recognize the importance to take a stance. Anyway, this was written after, after Boris Johnson got into power. And it's about um, getting entrenched in binary positions, polarized positions. My anger made you wrong and me right. And the truth is, I don't want to fight. I'm tired of feeling brittle, hardened, little in the face of all this chaos. And I don't want to hate, but I'm scared it's too late. Because the words I daren't speak are dark 
accusatory and sharp, and I'm digging deep, trying to find better words to say, a better way. And I know it's going to cost me. My reserves feel dry, full of howling why. And I'm not listening because I'm judging. I'm christening you racist, idiot, callous, bigot. I've figured you out. There's no room for doubt that I've misunderstood, that I've monopolized good, worthy, caring, right. There couldn't possibly be some other reality where you have a story to offer me. And accepting that gift is going to cost me my pride. I mean, you can say that I'm willfully blind, but I think you'll find if you had the slightest bit of hindsight, you'd look at the high stakes, realize your mistakes, and change. There is no shame. I am not the kind of person to tell you I told you so. <laughs> Except, I probably am, though. I mean, my roots static slowly die while I wait for you to try to bridge this gulf, scale the wall I built, fueled by some kind of guilt. Storm the castle, rescue me from my fortress of negativity. You see, ultimately, the values I say I'm for, I don't embody anymore. I'm not the me I want to be. I want to love more wildly. I want to be that radiant, open-hearted hug that sees past all difference and instead looks up. But it's almost like I've made it to be that part of my identity is anti your views, is anti you. And I left religion because of its us and thems, and here I am again, making it binary, creating adversaries, when I know, but I know, but I know, but I know, but I know that it is love that transforms us. Giving it, receiving it, being it in people's lives is a fantastic response to the howling why. And I don't know where you start to mend a a broken heart. I mean, real love is hard. It has teeth and grit. But it's in me. That's why I give a shit. And maybe it's reframing. It's certainly stop blaming and try a different approach fueled by active hope. And I don't know where hope comes from. But I know action is the key. And even if it's going to cost me, I think I'm ready. Thank you. Oh, yeah, right? Oh, so true. Um, I actually think, I don't know, I'd be interested to ask you more about you describing that you don't know if you feel the same. But for me, in the audience, like, that felt very relevant. And um, probably, yeah, probably a moment to um, choose love over um, fighting because um, I mean we know why you know there's so much unrest in our environment and um, whenever I give myself time to really 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 f f like think about it it does come back to love and peace um, I'm actually going to do a 24-hour radio broadcast on the 11th of December. 
on the themes of freedom and peace. And we're gonna hijack as many community radio stations as we can all over the world. So if anybody has any contacts, please let me know. And I'm gonna be asking everybody, everyone, all of us, to respond to this one prompt, which is, what does peace sound like to you? Um, and I've got an email address that you can just email your recording of peace. And we'll play for 24 hours and try to collectively cast broadly <laughs> love. Because <laughs> for me, I find it in music, I find it in conversation, I find it in the written word. Um, but I wouldn't say that I'm religious, but I'm spiritual and prayer feels so real. <laughs> Um, whether you describe it as meditation or choir, yeah, it feels so real. And there's so much love in that silence, um, which I'm not seeing any, like, from... I mean, there are some people that give me hope in terms of vocal people, but I, I'm really exhausted from the screaming, like, into a void. Like, I really want love. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> I know we've got it. So I guess um, this is an opportunity to ask the atmosphere for peace everywhere. I think it's really important. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, there's an amazing Hawaiian phrase called aponopono. Does anyone know it? Yeah, I love it so much. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I need. It's aponopono. And it translates as, um, I don't know if I've got the order right, but it's like, I'm sorry, I love you, please forgive me, thank you. And the practice is an ancient practice. Um, so I, I thank, like, Hawaiian culture in its indigenous wisdom for the, le the learning of that, because you can um, repeat Ha'oponopono or the translation again and again and again and again, and it will transform you into a space of forgiveness and love. And it's quite powerful. Um, should we carry on? I might need another Prosecco, I'm not gonna lie. Francisco, hello. I didn't think that the UK would be this racist. Uh, I'm currently working at a hotel, scrubbing toilets and making beds all day. Um, if there's any communists or anarchists in the crowd that have an extra room, because I want to quit my job and stop living at that fucking hotel. Anyways. This poem is called Seduced by Memory. 
This is the story of the Latin American diaspora. The first thing you will feel is the heat. My professor, Alejandro Murguia of San Francisco State University, tells me to write the, the story of the Latin American diaspora. He takes me in his car, and in the span of 25 minutes, he tells me about the last 25 years of his life and how he ended up with, Ale, with Allen Ginsberg in Nicaragua. I tell him, Alejandro, that's a lot. How can I write the story of the Latin American diaspora? And I tell Alejandro, if it has an immigration center, it is not a city. It is a detention center. If the city has a prison, it is not a city. It is a prison. The Latin Americans were given two kisses on the cheek before they left the city, the barrio, Southern California, the heat. The first thing that they saw is exploitation. Why did we come to this poor country? We learned all there is to know about Marx and the music that the French people like. We woke up intoxicated with egalitarianism. They served me a cup of victory. This is some working class Mexican poetry. My mother says, mijo, si escribes poesía que sea de la clase obrera, talk about us, talk about how we were undocumented, how we were actually there. I think that Southern California thinks it's an ocean, but it's not. It just, it's just us. What are we doing here? surviving for no reason in fucking particular you see we won't go far today we won't go far tomorrow trust me heaven and hell cannot count but get, get the fucking roman civilization out of your mind what are we doing here we're trying to survive get the roman civilization out of your mind or how capitalism and patriarchy fucked into the world was blurry to everyone or i think that this is the diaspora of the palestinians or Maybe this is the, the diaspora of the Haitians in Tijuana, Mexico. How the Haitians assimilated with us, black and brown, was beautiful. How they started loving with us, black and brown, in one of the most poorest places in the Western Hemisphere. You have no, no idea how sincere that was. My love, this is some working class poetry or how the cocaine washes in from the sea, or how you will turn away, or how my Mexican hands are still brown in Europe, or how my life is gonna have some drama, or the gringos will look at you at the university and stare at you, or must it be that the third world threw its wedding rings into a river, or can you believe that people actually work and marry here? Better yet, can you produce a free man, a free woman? This music is out of town. Having an American passport is having your heart ripped out while not being able to go to the doctor. The professor of peace studies, Vernon Butler, tells me that he was supposed to get killed the day that Fred Hampton was supposed to, that did get killed. And Vernon Butler tells me, if you keep, if you keep not letting the pain out, you're going to get an ulcer. A few years later, I start spitting out blood. Do you see why feminism never won in Mexico? or in Latin America, does it sound like a contradiction? If the United States was there, wasn't there, we would be forced to dialogue with earthquakes, with these natural resources you call beauty, or how we're ashamed of our feet, or there goes the poet, killing without killing. If you reverse the dream any further, you will find Gaza as if Gaza wasn't alive with all these thousands of bruises, as if Tijuana wasn't alive with all these thousands of bruises. The first thing I remember when I was five was that black and brown people in Southern California were killing each other. My dad was a victim of it, covered in blood. I remember growing up with asthma because it was more beautiful that way. Exploitation was a little bit more beautiful that way. However, when we moved to the small town of, in Alabama, the black family next to us gave us brown family some sugar. 
However, our spines are su still subjugated by those that don't understand our broken smiles. What are we doing here? Surviving. For no reason in fucking particular. How this dream requires more condemned Palestinians, more condemned Mexicans, Haitians, Algerians. We get shot. We get white sheets on California. There goes the poet. Killing without killing. Man, you got to know how to cut a throat on the way to cutting a throat. They told me I was proletarian. They, they told me I was diamonds. More so, the 50% of the population in Palestine, in Gaza, are children. Get the Roman civilization out of your mind. I keep thinking that this is a painting, but it's not. This is, this is just a hood, the ghetto, el barrio, mi madre me dice, si vas a escribir poesía que sea de la clase obrera, it's going to have some Palestinians in the prayer. Nobody interrupt them. Just be quiet a little bit. There goes the poet, killing without killing. Alejandro, I tell him, if I'm going to write the story of the diaspora, let it include Haitians. Make it beautiful. Make it, make it real. Sometimes, suicide is power because sometimes we live stronger as ghosts. Better yet, stealing us is the most smartest thing that they ever did. And I'm here in the small town of Alabama, and I ask myself, is every white person a white man? And I am here in San Francisco with my people, mi gente, what are we doing here? Surviving. And there's a group of men on 16th and Mission, and nobody has a job, so none of them is actually there. Mi madre me dice, si vas a escribir poesía. My mother sneaked across the Mexican-U.S. border because she dyed her hair blonde, and they thought she was a white woman. Fuck the Border Patrol. Fuck IDF. Fuck your oppression. Fuck, fuck your exploitation. There goes the poet killing without killing. You have to know how to cut a throat on the way to cutting a throat. Man, it, you should get into painting. Tell lies more deeply. If it's going to... If it's going to have some Palestinians in it make, it, make it a beautiful painting. And when the four walls demand to be heard, or when the children of Gaza demand to be heard, you open your fucking heart. And this dream requires more condemned working class, black and brown, looking all so beautiful. My dear, if this city has a prison, it is not a city, it is a prison. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francisco, thank you. Um, I'll continue to, to ask people as well locally about a room, potentially. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your, I'm so glad that you write, you know, yeah, we're all lucky that you write. Um, do you paint? Oh, you got to start painting. I painted for the first time this year. It was cool. <laughs> like, it did something for my, my hippie mind. I was like, oh. But yeah, just, let's let's paint <laughs> um okay so unfortunately we're running at over an hour late and <laughs> we're not allowed a lock-in i tried um but we so we can't we won't be able to hear from the amazing petra i'm sure would have blown us away sophia and isabel and i'm really really sorry but I'm, I'm getting this like deep feeling that we definitely need to do this again. So will you come back? Yeah. I definitely want to do this again. Um, yeah, I'm like, can we do it like for a whole month? <laughs> I don't do things by halves, you know. <laughs> um, all right. So um, we're going to finish with our guest of honor that we are hosting in this city 
who has just been radiant and joyful. Um, and just like, yeah, so many things. I think we all can feel what this person gives off um, is again, just this beautiful interconnected sense of vitality that I think that we've all perhaps shared this evening. So um, from uh, all of the ancestors that we are here with as well, I, I want to say thank you to them. Um, and I feel like they're holding us in this space, which is just very, very, very special. I was, I've been looking at the candle and it's like dancing. Um, oh yeah, another thing that we've got to do is dancing, because you mentioned dancing, I very much like dancing. So we should do some dancing at some point. Um, and we're gonna finish with Catherine Joy White, my new little sister. <laughs> Um, from the very, very last chapter, which I started writing um, the morning after Roe v. Wade was overturned, and I was so angry. Um, and that isn't what this chapter is. Actually, it ended up becoming a letter to my imaginary daughter that I hope I will one day have, and it is, I guess, my dream for her, and it's my dream for all of us, and I think hearing, hearing what I've heard tonight, and the talent and the, the abundance of power to create change through art that is in the room, I know that this is for everything I've heard, so, yes. To my daughter, I wish you a life of glorious, mutinous simplicity. I wish for you a bike with three wheels that you wobble and ride, the gap in your teeth and the wind in your fro, your own brand of special, your signature, shall we say, as you ride not a bike, but a chariot, queen of a world where simplicity rules, where kindness prevails and possibility fuels you because nothing is off limits. You would never deem it so. And you don't. You pedal furiously into class and sit up straight as you learn, curious with your questions and dedicated with your task of finding out why flowers of all colors bloom from buds that are green and how the letters from the alphabet join together to write your name, your own name, the beauty of that. I hope that you wear it like a badge of honor that you will say it with pride as your spidery letters join up into joined up handwriting and the day that you're allowed to use a pen for the first time. And use it you will as you write letters and notes and stories, writing your world in the mud and the sand, crafting playdates and sleepovers. And soon you won't need that third wheel anymore as your chariot flies without support, but never fear. I'm here. If you need me, if you fall, I'll be there. That's what my dad said to me when I learned to ride my two-wheeler bike. And he turned to me and told me, oh, you don't need your daddy anymore. Oh, but daddy, I said to him, confused at his reasoning, always ready to put him right. But daddy, I do when I fall. My daughter, I hope you fly high for eternity. But I promise you this. It is okay if you fall. Do not worry, even when your heart breaks and you think you may never be whole again, because you will. And you might cry, but that's okay, because crying is allowed for you, my daughter. I wish for you tears of joy when you get on an airplane for the first time alone, seeing worlds that so far were nothing more than a dream, and that when you see them, something in you clicks and connects. This is part of your becoming, a wise woman once said. And you bring this becoming home with you to a summer of sweaty, exhilarating parties and nightclubs using your older cousin's ID. And when your exam results come in, you might cry again because you put every piece of your heart into them. Maybe you didn't, but it doesn't matter 
the world is yours now, and you are leaving home with nothing but a notepad and a backpack and a heart full of stars to places where learning happens, the kind you find in books that open your mind, the kind you find in not enough sleep, and friends that you meet by chance. And from the moment you look at each other, you know that this is a soulmate, best mate, till death do us part kind of thing. You'll laugh till you cry, and cry when life comes around hard, and it might, it may hit you and my daughter in my heart. But I wish for you that it will never hit you harder than you can withstand, and that one day you will look back on those moments. Take a deep breath, breathe out the sorrow, breathe in the light of a you that feels right. Just putting some time in front of it helps a lot, my daughter. I wish for you love that holds you to account, holds you to the light, and holds you when you're breaking even if you don't know how to articulate it. I pray that you learn how to articulate it. I pray that you will never need to hold your voice or suppress yourself for fear of being too much. You can never be too much, my daughter. And I pray that in these magical, messy years of becoming, that you don't work too hard, that you remember to see the sunsets and sleep and sometimes to say no. Sometimes it's good to say no. I wish for you good hair, good food, good conversations, the kind that make your mind feel like it's growing so large it might just implode because you'd never considered thinking in that way before. And I wish for you that you can walk into any workplace you choose with your head held high and your hair higher because you exude professional no matter what you look like. And everybody knows that they are lucky to have you. You have nothing to prove. You will never have anything to prove. I wish you sunsets, late nights, good coffee, long runs, defending yourself when you know you're right, saying sorry when you know you're wrong, meeting new people, staying home, staying in, concerts, art exhibitions, football matches, not getting out of bed all day. I wish you the freedom and the bravery to dare to try whatever it is that you like without knowing how it will work out or even caring and feeling good in your body with wealth in more ways than money. It's a generational thing. And I wish for you a foundation that you can build up from and that your grandmother will stand in your golden tower and look out in silent, joyful amazement, weeping for the sights that she never saw while she was down in the basement, building brick by brick. Her faint hope that one day you and I might see the sky and the light and the sun rise from these heights. And when we lay her body to rest, I hope you remember that she was weary from the work and no reward. But then remember that there was a reward and the reward was you. Death is silence and silence scares you. But Silence can be golden. We can be peaceful. We don't always have to be interrupted. But I interrupt you today because I want you to know, my daughter, that even if the world shows you hostility, doesn't align with my plan, still hasn't recognized your beauty, your worth, more than any gun or legislation or politics over your precious life, well, guess what? It doesn't matter. Because what connects us, my daughter, will outlast their politics and their lawmaking and their life taking. We can take too. I want you to take. Take this thread of gold that ties you to me and me to your grandmother who weaves pure silk as she sits with your great grandmother and your great great grandmother and Melinda Russell, Michaela Cole. Mary McLeod Bethune, Breonna Taylor, Nina Simone, Hattie McDaniel, Phyllis Wheatley-Peters, Wangari Matai, ad infinitum, these women are in you right now. So how can anyone tell you you are not destined for greatness? You are greatness. It is yours. 
And these are the things I wish for you. It's nothing much, it's just the usual. <laughs> Glorious, mutinous, simplicity. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I cried again. <laughs> um, okay, amazing. Yeah, there's not much more really to be said. Like, have an amazing rest of the evening um, and a great weekend. Lots to ponder on. Um, yeah, thank you so much to everyone. And especially thank you to Lighthouse Books. <laughs> Myri and team, you seriously rock. Like, I'm learning a lot from you. Um, so I'm really, really appreciative of the sacred space that you hold. Thank you. Um, right, let's go. Dance, maybe? <laughs>